Okay, so we're going to get started. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Anker. If you're here live, welcome. Um, just to give you an idea, I'm going to be introducing myself and why I should be teaching you on how to become a better parent. And then I'm going to be having a short, uh, about a 40 minute uh, PowerPoint presentation. And that'll give you all the tools to become a better parent. And then I'm going to stop recording and I'll open it up to question and answer at the end. So please stay to the end if you have any questions. And um, I'm happy to stay on for a little while and, and answer any of those questions. So welcome to my masterclass of becoming a better parent. And we hope to do this in one hour. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about myself and what I do. I'm a parent empowerment coach and I help uh, new moms. I'm saying my expertise is with children ages birth to about age 12. And I help to teach effective discipline strategies and positive communication tools so that we can create a united front with our parenting partner so that we can gain confidence in ourselves and we can raise responsible, resilient, and respectful children. So before I was mom to my almost, well, to my 12-year-old, almost 13-year-old daughter, Maggie, my nine-year-old daughter, Annie, and my six-year-old son, Walter, I was a Montessori educator. And I taught in a preschool kindergarten classroom. I worked um, several years as a teacher, and then I was the director of a preschool kindergarten program overseeing three classrooms and teaching teachers and mentoring parents. And then I was an assistant head of school at a large Montessori school up in Massachusetts, Oak Meadow School. And it was at Oak Meadow where I kind of became that disciplinarian. So I would have a lot of three and four year old boys in my office and those seventh and eighth grade girls. And it was right when um, social media came out and there was some cyber bullying issues going on. I had a lot of teachers in my office. I was doing a lot of uh, kind of social conflict resolution with uh, teaching teams, uh, the drama teacher, the gym teacher, and I had a lot of parents in my office. So. I thought I had some great advice for those parents. And I kind of wish I was a fly on the wall of what I told them because this kind of happened before I became a parent. So fast forward a few years and I think Maggie was about three and I had this newborn little baby in my arms and I was so scared. I kind of felt like a failure. My Three-year-old was not listening to anything I said. In fact, she would do the exact opposite. And I remember one day, you know, nursing my, my middle child and my husband was leaving for work and I was really scared. I, I had to go to the post office. I had to get some groceries. And I was like, how can I do this? You know, how can I do this with um, this strong-willed preschooler and, um, and the baby? So I really... I internalized a lot of it and I didn't share a lot of my feelings. I wished I had. Um, I, like I said, I kind of felt like a failure because I was an educator. Like I came into this job thinking I was gonna be really good and I felt really bad. So I was working as a consultant at the time and I was working um, with a woman who owned a, a Montessori school and I was doing her orientation for her and all the parent workshops. And I shared with her my challenges. And I was like, I thought I was going to be good, but I'm really bad at being a mom. And she said, no, no one's bad at being a mom. It just takes practice and you need to learn some skills. And so she had asked, had you ever heard of positive discipline? And I said, oh yeah, I remember hearing Jane Nelson speak at a Montessori conference. So I dusted off my positive discipline for preschoolers book. So she's written many, many books, positive discipline for you know, babies up to positive discipline for teenagers, positive discipline for a single parent family, all these great tools. And so I read 
And it really resonated with me and my philosophy and what I already knew within Montessori. And I said, I need to learn more. So I went and I got my training. So I'm a trained facilitator to teach parents and a trained facilitator to teach teachers. So I've been doing workshops for about the past 10 years and, um, and now doing more private coaching. So COVID came right around the time when I started to do more one-on-one -on -one and still group, but it's, over, it's online right now, but I hope to get back into the group uh, workshop soon. So I am gonna share my screen and find our workshop here and we're gonna get started. Okay, so let's see, I think, there we go. I'm getting better and better at this every day. So we are going to do the slideshow and we're gonna start it from the beginning. So let's see here, yep. Okay, so I hope everybody can see um, my screen. So here we go, we're gonna try to do this in an hour. And by the end, I promise, you'll become a better parent. <laughs> so this is like what we all want, right? Like this little guy just looks like the happy, a happy kid. We want our kids to be happy. Um, he's got a little twinkle in his eye. Uh, we want our kids to be responsible and start to learn things. I always say, you know, I don't want my kids to grow up entitled or like a spoiled brat. Like you want them to be responsible and, and respectful. Uh, you want them to maybe be successful and, and feel good with themselves. Probably want them to have good friendships and um, when I do this work in a large workshop or with one-on-one, -on -one, we talk about um, all our hopes and dreams of what we want because we're talking about this long range um, parenting goal. So here's what we want. And sometimes this is what it feels like. We are doing so much and responsible for so many things. And I think this was when, you know, I really felt the overwhelm as a, you know, young, not, you know, young moms when my kids were little and there was just so much. And I was just trying to do it all. I was trying to keep the house tidy. I was trying to cook. I was trying to, you know, like she had, like literally I had one baby in, in my baby carrier, you know, one on the ground and one who was telling me what to do. And, um, and it was hard. It was really hard. And I know it's a struggle. And, it, you know, some days I still feel like this. And I actually had found this um, image before the pandemic. So I feel like when the pandemic hit, it was just like, Parenting in a pandemic was, you know, brought it to a whole new level. And I tell all the parents that I work with now, like, we really need to make sure to give ourselves a lot of self-compassion and grace during this past year of, of everything that we had to do. On top of the responsibilities of being a parent, we then had to be the educator and the doctor and the psychologist and the entertainer and everything. So it's a lot. So what I have found throughout, I'd say, yeah, about the past 10 years is that there were some mindset shifts that I needed to make. And I'm still learning about this mindset idea. There's daily rut routines that can really, really help. And I follow the work of Kim John Payne, who wrote Simplicity Parenting. He's a Waldorf educator. And he even says in his book, he's like, it's not until families have like three or four children that they realize how important routines are. And that was the case for me. I was, you know, trying to do it all. And really what my kids needed was a, 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 a consistent routine and effective communication. You know, sometimes we say our, our, there's power struggles and, you know, our kids just want to, we'll say no and they will. But if we learn some effective communication, um, it'll help them to be more cooperative. So, the past year with the pandemic, I've learned about positive psychology and positive discipline is based on the work of um, Alfred Adler and Rudolf Dreikers who are two Vietnamese psychologists and they were kind of like before positive psychology. Um, and I also learned, um, I've been learning the past several years about nonviolent communication. And so how we can really communicate using empathy 
and, um, and a little vulnerability, but really understanding our children, our spouses, um, our colleagues. Um, and when we build this connection, our kids feel good and our kids want to cooperate. So I talked a little bit before about who I am and I, um, I help overwhelmed parents who are just exhausted from all the power struggles. And I help them to learn skills so that their kids begin to cooperate. I help parenting partners get on the same page. And you're not gonna have the same philosophy because we all were raised differently and we all have our own different experiences. So my husband and I are very different, um, but we see eye to eye and he, follow, I, he respects what I say and I respect what he says. Um, and also, I think a lot of the tools that I help teach, it strengthens all relationships. Yes, I first focus on the relationship we have with our children, but I find the foundation with your parenting partner and the foundation with ourselves being most important. Actually, that foundation with ourselves is what's most important. So... I know this is um, being recorded and I'm going to send the recording out, but if you're here live, if you want to write in the chat, what are some of the challenges that you're having right now? And usually, and I'll, you know, to, to make this quicker, um, usually when I, you know, I've done this workshop with, you know, 75 people and I've done this workshop with five people. And we brainstorm lists and we, you know, I just tell everyone, you just write down all the challenges that's happening now. And this, uh, the, the list on the left, the challenges now is, you know, usually the best of. <laughs> so bedtime hassles, right? I know I had that. Sibling fighting, got that. Eating, power struggles, screen time usage, don't listen, back talk. Hmm, actually all these sound like my household right now. Um, so these are our challenges that we're dealing with right now. And these are the challenges we're, we're going to continually have. I mean, this is kids stuff. This is just what happens. However, what I would love for you to do is practice this little visualization with me right now and just close your eyes and imagine your child at age 25 and I say age 25 because that's where the neuroscientists have just recently discovered, you know, maybe in the past 15 years, that the prefrontal cortex that we're going to learn about in a little bit is finally finished developing at the age of 25. And I'll tell you all the things that that prefrontal cortex does. But imagine this kid, this adult, this young adult, walking into your house on, say, Thanksgiving weekend. And what are the gifts? What are the life skills and characteristics you hope and dream for your child to have as an adult? And the list on the right is usually like the best of what my clients have said. They want their kids to be independent. They want their kids to be kind, honest, hardworking, Respectful, they want to be with us. They want to come home for Thanksgiving, right? Resilient, resilience has been a big one this past year. You know, what's gonna happen? Well, we don't know. We don't know how this is gonna be affecting our kids, but if they're resilient, if we're resilient, we're gonna be okay. They're gonna be okay. So think about that. And I would challenge you to, if you have a parenting partner, do this with your parenting partner. Say, let's brainstorm. What do we want our kids to have? What are the big values that we, we are as a family? And usually you can come back with, you know, when using discipline, and I think of discipline a little different than punishment, discipline is to teach. So when we think about teaching our kids, how are we going to teach them these things? And um, usually what I'll do, and, and maybe I'll even do this now, let's see. Yeah, I can, I'll, I'll do this quick activity. And I know it's a little hard because I'm not seeing our, um, the, our participants now, but we're gonna be doing a, a question and answer at the end. 
but I just love this activity. So a lot of positive discipline is, is um, experiential lessons. So I would love to do this quick experiential lesson with you now. I can't see you, but you can see me. So you're gonna do what I say. So I would love for you to be sitting up tall in your chair and let's see, let me make sure that everybody can also see. Um, I don't know if you could see me. Hmm. Let me put this up so that, okay, you need this. So you need to be able to see me. So, okay, so sit up tall in your chair Maybe just roll your shoulders back. You're gonna put your hands right on your knees and you're gonna take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your nose. And you're gonna do that again because I know you as busy parents don't breathe enough. So breathe in through your nose and out through your nose. You're gonna tap your knees gently. You're gonna put your hands in the air you're gonna make a little circle with your pointer finger and thumb, and you're gonna put that circle right on your chin. So put it right on your chin. Do you have it on your chin or did you follow me and put it on your cheek? So I wonder if you were here or if you were here. And I know when I do this live, I catch like probably 75% of the people um, have follow me. And some smart ones think I'm crazy and or go like this and they're like, who is this person? She's had a little too much to drink or something. So what this is, what is this showing us? What is this showing us? And it's another um, thing that neuroscientists have discovered that there's these mirror neurons in our brain, these mirror neurons, these monkey see, monkey do neurons. And it's not just with what we watch, you know, so kids are gonna do what we do is, is what it comes down to. Um, so it's like the example of when you see somebody yawn and you have, feel like you have to yawn. Those are mirror neurons. For me, I'm a, an empath. I see somebody cry or, you know, hear about a sad story and I start to tear up and I'm, cry I'm crying with them. But it's, it's, that's what our kids feel. They feel what we are feeling. So we have to be so careful with what we say, what we do, and how we do it. Because this is how our children are going to learn those skills. They're going to watch us. So here's another challenge. When you're having those challenges, bedtime hassles or the power struggles during mealtime, trying to get your kid to leave a play date, when you're having those struggles, how are you showing up? And are you using those life skills and characteristics, that list on the, um, on the side? And there's probably many other you know, things, of course, that we want for our kids. So how are you showing up? And that's the work, that's the hard work. Um, because it's not just what's happening now in our environment, it's way back when of when we were parented. It's way back when from our age birth to about age seven that all this, um, these limiting beliefs come from. So sometimes, you know, pa parents will say to me like, oh God, I never wanted to sound like my parents. And that's what happens when I'm triggered. I, I say things that I never wanted <laughs> to say to my kids. Um, and that's why I say like parenting partners are going to be different. They're going to be different because we were we were all raised differently and um, we've all learned different things. Um, so what I look at is this equal triangular relationship of the parent, the child, and the environment. And in my programs, we are working with all three things. We first have to focus on ourselves as the parent. Um, and we also need to learn a little bit about child development and what works with kids. And then we have to prepare the environment for our kids to be successful. So looking at that close relationship with yourself, and this is where the idea of like putting the oxygen mask on ourselves first before we're taking care of our kids, you know, making sure that we are giving ourselves 
time to become this, the best version of ourselves. And I think that's what I learned early on when I was feeling overwhelmed, when I was exhausted and just feeling like crap, I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't saying nice things to myself. Um, and actually some of the things I was saying wasn't even true. So we need to really learn um, a little bit. And I, that's what I'm delving into more now is within um, my encouragement consulting. I was trained by Lynn Lott to be an encouragement consultant. We have to first parent our inner child before we can parent our children. So make sure that we are the, the best version of ourselves so that we can be the best parent we can be. So like I said, we need to be happy, healthy, resilient and empathetic first, if that's what we wanna see in our kids. So um, an amazing uh, neuroscientist, Dr. Dan Siegel, he wrote many uh, books. Uh, one is called The Whole Brain Child. He wrote The Yes Brain. He's um, written um, what, one about with, with teenagers and he does this handy brain model that I'm gonna do with you right now. And I highly recommend you do this with your child so they understand it's, it's, I think, so important to learn a little bit about brain science and what's happening in our brains. So here's our handy brain model. You can put your right hand up. And if you look at your palm down, that represents the midbrain, or I'm sorry, that's the brain stem. It's where the automatic bodily functions happen, your heart rate, your breathing, all the things we don't even think about. Then if you put your thumb over the middle, that represents the midbrain, the amygdala. This amygdala is where our emotions and our memories are stored. And it's also where the major radar lives. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna freeze? Are you gonna fight? Or are you gonna flight and get out of there? So this is our midbrain. It's also called the reptilian brain. Sometimes um, some of the work that I do with schools, I tell the kids, this is our lizard brain, our lizard brain. So now we're gonna put our, our fist down. The back represents our senses, where all our senses come in. Our cortex is all right here. The cortex is where the thinking happens. And then this prefrontal cortex, which is not done developing until the age of 25, that is where our emotions, our interpersonal relationships, our response flexibility, how are we gonna to respond to what happens in the world around us, our intuition, our mind sight, which is social cognition, which is you know, listening to what our brain is saying, you know, those inner thoughts I was talking about before, self-awareness, letting go of fears and morality. It's also the, the term, the executive functioning skills. That's here in the prefrontal cortex. So this isn't even done developing until the age of 25. And now what happens, and this is what neuroscientists have discovered, happens to your brain. What happens when you've had a really hard day? You know, I'll just explain my day the other day. You thought you were gonna have all three kids in school and no. Pandemic happened, people are quarantined, the house is a mess, you, you haven't done the grocery shopping because you're supposed to do that that day when you had to, and just everything is going wrong. And then someone says something to you and boom, you, this is what happens to your brain. You flip your lid. And so what's showing here? So if you remember that amygdala, that's where our emotions and our memories are stored. That's like what I said, you might sound like your parent and you never wanted to sound like that person. And this is that major radar, the freeze, fight, flight, the cavemen had, they had it for a reason, but for some reason, our brain goes there and it, you know, it works all the, um, I think it's called the sympathetic. So what we need to, work on is the parasympathetic. So how do we get from here to here? And it's called self-regulation. And this is a skill that our kids don't have yet that they need to learn. So this is a skill that we need to learn how to do and then we need to teach them. So some things that I teach our, um, our my parents is 
what helps us to feel good? You know, when we brainstorm that list, what helps you to feel good? Um, maybe it's meditation, maybe it's going for a run, maybe it's a walk, maybe it's getting a drink of water, uh, whatever, whatever helps you to feel good and make sure you do that. So that's self-care. So first make sure you're taking care of yourself and then um, knowing that you might need to take that deep breath. So when we practice that breath earlier, you can practice a box breath, which is breathing in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds and pause for four seconds. And that is supposed to help a lot with anxiety. Um, you, like I said, just getting outside, getting a little sunshine. So whatever you need to do. And I've, you know, showed this to my kids. Like I said, show this to your children and tell them, say, sometimes mommy flips her lid. Like my brain's not working right. And I might yell and I might say something I wished I didn't. So I need to learn to do this. This is something that I teach parents to help their kids to create a positive time out space. So we need to create a positive time out space and our kids need to create that positive time out space. I know I have a video of that in my, um, in the parent empowerment group. So if you want to join my Facebook group, I'm, I've done a bunch of videos on positive timeout and I think I need to do it again because I'm working on it with my kids too. We recently moved into a new house. So I think one of my kids doesn't have a positive timeout space yet and we need to do that. So people do better when they feel better. That's the whole idea. So fostering the three R's at home, how do we, this is effective discipline. You know, how do we raise respectful, responsible and resilient kids? So these five um, tips here are the five tools for effective discipline that I'm gonna go through each one quickly. The first one is, this is something that Rudolf Dreikers discovered that all human beings have this need for belonging and significance. Belonging and significance. This feeling of unconditional love and that they belong. They're a part of maybe the family or they're a part of something. And significance, like they have a little power over their life. And this is where we're helping to teach them um, you know, maybe making limited choices, having those limited choices, but they still have power. They can make the choice. So belonging and significance. Now, if your child for some reason feels like they don't have that belonging and significance, maybe you just yelled at them. Maybe they were leaving the playground and, you know, it wasn't their choice to leave the playground. Um, maybe you just had a new baby and it wasn't their choice to get a new sibling. They don't feel significant anymore. They're not the one anymore. So for some reason, if they don't feel this, they're gonna find a mistaken way to get it, to get it. So if you can think of and imagine in your head an iceberg and the tip of the iceberg is what we see. We see the misbehavior. We see the bad behavior. We see the temper tantrums, the crying, the struggles, the sibling fighting. But what is underneath the iceberg? It's this idea that they need to feel love and, and power. They need to feel belonging and significance. And if they don't feel that, Rudolf Dreikers found that there's four misbehaviors that he just saw all these kids go in. And one is undue attention. It's that like annoying behavior. One is misguided power, the power struggles. One is revenge. You hurt them, so they're gonna hurt you back. And another is assumed inadequacy. They just can't do it, so they're gonna just give up. And I, um, within the parent empowerment program, I help parents to become the detectives and figure out what misbehavior it is and then what are the tools that we can, we can use to help them to feel better to help them to feel that sense of belonging and significance. Another effective discipline strategy is being kind and firm at the same time. Kindness shows respect for the child and firmness shows respect for yourself and respect for 
the situation. You know, we're the adult, we have that prefrontal cortex and um, we should, we need to have these clear and consistent limits and boundaries. So you're kind and firm. And I always tell parents to just change the word but to and. So instead of, yeah, I, I know you wanna play your video game, but it's time for dinner. Hey, I see you're having a lot of fun playing your video game and it's time for dinner. I need your help. So that's just a little kindness and firmness. I also love the, you know, asked and answered. You asked and I answered. The answer is no, honey. It's not going to change. I love you and the answer is no. So you're kind, but you're laying down the law. The answer is no. I'm not going to change my mind. It's no. So kind and firm. This takes, this takes time. And I love um, my mentor, Jane Nelson, talks about this. And she actually is a parent of seven. And now she has lots of grandkids. But she said if there was one tool that she could, she wished she was better at from the beginning, it was this. How do you be kind and firm at the same time? It's a balance. So long-term results. That's what we talked about before when we had the list of challenges and then the list of the 25 year old child, those life skills and characteristics. So this is long range parenting goals. Like we're gonna do something and it's gonna work one day. We're gonna try a positive discipline tool and it's not gonna work the next day. But what we're figuring out is what is my child learning? What are they saying to themselves? So we're in this for the long term results. It's gonna take several times. I love the idea of um, positive discipline believes in, hey, mistakes are going to happen and mistakes are just opportunities for learning. So use that for yourself. You're going to make a mistake. And you know what? I made a mistake. Just an opportunity for learning. I'm going to do it like this next time. Your child's going to make a mistake. You made a mistake. Opportunity to learn for next time. Don't shame don't blame, don't make them feel like a worm. You know, they made a mistake. Help them, help them to not make that same mistake next time. And they're probably going to again. So social and life skills. So discipline is based on the root word disciplina, which means a follower of truth to teach. So we're teaching life skills. We're teaching social skills. They're learning social skills through us, learning social skills through their siblings. I love the, um, you did a whole workshop on sibling fighting and, and sibling rivalry. And if you had siblings of your own, and I actually have the same as what I grew up with. So I have an older sister and a younger brother, and I have two girls and a boy. And I learned a lot from having siblings. And no, it wasn't always, we weren't always best friends. We are now, um, but I, I, you learn a lot through the sibling fighting and the relationships. And then the last one is developing autonomy. And that's what I loved. And that's when I first created my consulting business. I called it Montessori in the home because I saw how successful Montessori schools were with teaching children and just preparing the environment. And I wanted to help parents to do that in their home. And really it's helping the parents to see how do you create a home that's completely um, child accessible? And then how they build the, um, how they learn to, to do anything and they build those skills. Okay, so I'm gonna do some fun little activities with you. I'm not, I'm recording this, so I'm not going to show any um, of the participants live, but like I said, I will open it up for question and answer at the end. But what I would love for you to do is kind of visualize this and, and imagine you're the two children. So I'm going to pretend I'm talking to one child first. And I want you to just get an idea of like what you're thinking and feeling and deciding when I'm saying these things to the child. And then, um, and what I might do actually, I might stop the share for a minute so that, yeah, we'll do that. And then um, I'm gonna talk to another child. So just get into that role of pretend you are your child 
and get an idea of what you're thinking and feeling and deciding. Okay, go brush your teeth. Don't forget your coat. Go to bed. Do your homework. Stop fighting with your brother. Put your dishes in the dishwasher. Hurry up and get dressed, we're gonna be late. Stop whining. Pick up your toys. Okay, so that's the end of the first round. Now we're gonna do the second round. So now pretend you're your child again. Hey, what do you need to do so your teeth don't feel all scuzzy? What are you taking so you won't be cold outside? What's next in your bedtime routine chart? What is your plan for doing your homework? How can you and your brother solve this problem? What did we decide to do with our dishes when we're all done eating? What do you need to do so you, can, so you won't be late to school? I have so you can catch the bus on time, but like this year, we're not taking the bus. What words can you use so I can hear you? I love that one. What words can you use so I can hear you? What is your responsibility when you are finished playing with your toys? Okay, so get an idea of what you're thinking and feeling and deciding. So I know it's harder to ask the questions. And I also want to preface this is this is for a child ages four and up. For the child younger, like more like three and a half, three and a half and younger, it just, this is what we do. We put our jacket on, we'd go. It's, it's all the routines, the routines and the rituals. If your child's a little bit older, and I know you probably felt that too, is when I was telling you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, you're just going to be like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And that's what a lot of parents say in the workshops. They're like, I just wanted to not do what you were telling me to do because you were being so mean. <laughs> and my kids say it too, they're like, oh, you're being so mean. And it's just because I, I raise my voice and it's just because I get frustrated because they didn't listen to me the first time. So I raise my voice and then they think I'm being mean. But if we can use, so the questions are a what or a how question. So just catch yourself the next week, catch yourself telling, don't, blame or shame yourself. Don't make yourself feel bad. This is actually only, and I'll say it in the end, it's only three out of 10 times we've got to try to do this. Um, and just if you catch yourself telling, say, okay, next time I'm going to say it like this. And I remember doing this with Maggie when she was little and I had just learned this tool and we had a lot of power struggles. And then I just said, what do you need on your feet so we can go outside? And she was like, Socks and shoes, socks and shoes, socks and shoes. And she like made a song about it, got our socks and shoes on and we were out the door. And I was like, oh my God, this is genius, it works. Okay, so that is asking versus telling. So that's just one tool. And now I wanna do another um, slight little tool. Um, and another one that goes kind of with that is um, the do versus don't. And I hear parents say this, all the time, you know, don't hit your brother, don't do this, don't do that. So when you, you're, you catch yourself saying don't, change it to the affirmative. What do you want them to do? Keep your hands to yourself. Please walk along the pool. You know, so try to use the affirmative because um, that's another activity I do. And it's confusing. It's confusing when we say don't because they're like, well, what do you want me to do? So use the affirmative. Okay, so now you're gonna be my two children again, and we're gonna do another activity. And this is, um, it's gonna make you feel good. It's gonna make you feel good. So first, I want you just to, you're gonna be one child first, and then you're gonna be a second child with the next one. So I want you to get an idea of what you're thinking, feeling, and deciding. And just imagine you are your child's age. Oh, I'm, I'm so proud of you. You did it better than anyone else. Your painting is beautiful. You are such a good girl. I like the way you're sitting so nicely. You're so smart. You did it just like I told you. I like what you did. Good job. 
I wish the others could be just like you. You are the best player on the team. I'm so proud of you. You did it better than anyone else. Oh, I already said that one. Okay. So that's the end of that round. So kind of get an idea of what you're thinking, you're feeling, you're deciding. Okay, so probably feels pretty good, right? But now listen to these statements and see if you can figure out the difference. You figured it out for yourself. It took courage to stand up for yourself like that. Thanks for helping me. It really made my day easier. Look how far you've come. You can do it. Can you tell me about your painting? What colors did you use? I have faith in you. I care about you. You can decide what's best for you. How do you feel about it? I believe you can do it. I love you no matter what. Okay, so that's the end of that round. So you probably felt pretty good with both. Um, the first one I was praising. First one I was praising. And the second one I was using words of encouragement. So children need encouragement like a plant needs water. Um, there's a great article. So message me and I can send you the article. Alfie Cohn wrote this great article, The Five Reasons Why Not to Say Good Job. And this is something I learned in my Montessori training 20 years ago. And I was like, what? Like you hear everyone, great job, good job, yay, yay, you did it, you know? And it's like, is that bad? And they're like, no, it's not bad. However, there's so many other better ways you can say it than great job. So it's kind of just superficial. So the idea is, and I'm gonna just finish sharing my screen. Okay, good. So the idea is um, if we could, let's just, there we go. All of these little tools are based on the idea of building connection. So connection before correction. And I have a, you know, a lot of tools to teach on how to build this connection. One way, it's something, a very simple one that I'll share and then we'll, we'll be finishing up soon is special time. And special time kind of sounds corny. And I first thought I was like, oh, special time. I have three kids. How am I gonna spend special time with each child? Because special time, there's three A's that go with special time. You should be alone. So try to find time that you could be one-on-one -on -one with a child. Give them your attention, your full attention. Even say something like, hey, mom, I'm gonna put my phone down. Put your phone down, give them your full attention and your attitude. Hey, what are you interested? I wanna do something that you wanna do. So something that they wanna do. I was working with a family and they actually had six children. They were having a problem with their 12 year old daughter. And this was the one tool that I wanted them to start with. I was like, okay, sounds like she's feeling a little dethroned. Sounds like she's feeling like she doesn't have the love and, and that sense of belonging and significance. So try this, try the special time and make sure the mom does it and make sure the dad does it. And they said within a week, they were amazed at the change in her behavior. So it's this idea of connection, you know, making that connection. And I do it with my kids and it only has to be 10 minutes. It only has to be a short time. And sometimes like my little one, like it happened just yesterday. My six-year-old was like, can you jump on the trampoline with me? And I had so many other things I needed to do, but I was like, all I have to do is jump for like 10 minutes. And I was like, I didn't get my exercise in. So I'll make this my exercise. So yes, yes, I will jump on the trampoline with you. And he was just beaming. He had so much fun and um, he needed that. He needed that connection before correction. Okay, so a little bit about our environment. So 
when designing your home or creating routines, how can you make it accessible for the child? So definitely thinking about your kitchen and how you can help your child to maybe get more involved in the food prep or you know, choosing healthy snacks, you know, setting up the refrigerator so they know where their healthy snacks are and, and, and how to do that. But they're really trying to develop independence. So here I have my two daughters. So in the first picture, she's um, brushing butter on, for garlic bread. So what can they do with you in the kitchen? I know this past year I've been doing a lot more cooking and so they have been too. And it's been really, really a, like a silver lining with all this is they love it. Um, there's an excellent catalog called Montessori Services where you can get some of the tools that I have in the middle picture so that they have a child size peeler, a knife. I love this little red, um, chopper so they you know they chop it works great with potatoes and and everything and then thinking of like maybe your front foyer or wherever you come in to the house having a little step stool if you have a smaller child this is maggie when she was about three and she's putting on you know doing that little buckle on those sandals and i remember this moment so well like she did it and she was just like like i did it she did it because I had the two sandals there kind of in, um, you know, where they should be. You know, you, you sometimes have to create the space so that they can be successful. She sat down, she, we had time, a little bit of time, and she did it. So where can you build in that time to allow them to, to develop that autonomy that we talked about in the beginning? So we do need to think of ourselves kind of as the captain of the ship. So we're creating the environment. We're preparing the environment. We're developing the consistent boundaries and the limits. And then we just need to guide our kids and role model these behaviors. Easier said than done. <laughs> but um, just knowing that and, um, and knowing that, you know, we're gonna make mistakes and it's okay, it's okay. So I would love to offer anyone who's interested in learning more or they want to you know, work with me a little deeper to like really create some of these skills and, and develop ha them into habits so like it really works, um, to book a free 30 minute strategy call. I promise to help you figure out one big parenting challenge. And I can tell you a little bit about either the Parent Empowerment Program which is my signature one-on-one -on -one program for 90 days. And um, I also do group workshops and I'm still offering group workshops. It is via Zoom, but they still, um, they still you're still getting a lot out of them, although I miss our, our live workshops. Um, and I have a, um, a very inexpensive, a $27 like DIY course on my website. So you can go on my website and um, I created it last year. It's called The Kids Are Home. Now, what are we going to do? And it's kind of all the best of positive discipline strategies and uh, Montessori tools that I was doing to help me to, to stay sane. So thank you all so much for taking the time. It's all about empowering ourselves. I think knowledge is power. Empowering ourselves um, so that we can encourage our children. We can be that encouragement consultant for our children. Um, and every day, every day, you're just trying to become a little bit better. So, and remember, it's only three out of 10 times we have to try. So don't feel like a bad parent when you leave this workshop. No shame, no blame. We're all just trying our best. And that's something that I learned when I was studying to be an encouragement consultant understanding that our parents tried their best too. They did the best that they could with what they had, and we're doing the best that we can with what we have. And we're parenting in a pandemic, so give yourself lots of grace. Um, you can find me in a lot of places. I do have a free Facebook group. It's called the Parent Empowerment Group. I come live every once in a while, trying to create a community there of like-minded parents who are all just trying to be a little bit better every day. Um, and you can find some information on my website and there is my email. So I am going to stop.
stop sharing there. And I am going to stop the recording now. So I look forward to hearing from you. But I'm going to start the question and answer for anyone who is interested in doing that. I'm going to stop the recording.